Shall we open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3? We're going to take a look at kind of part 2 of this morning now, Malachi. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. And if you were not here, would encourage you to get the tape. It kind of goes hand in hand. I think I've taught maybe giving in maybe the last 30 years on maybe three, four times at the most. And uh, I don't really enjoy it, but probably... I've done more damage not teaching on it, honestly, because if you don't know what to do, then you're not going to understand the blessings of God. But, you know, so many pastors, they teach at every single service. And so, you know, they're beating you and everything else, so you kind of want to stay away from it. Then you have people who come for the first time, you know, and bless their hearts. They leave their church, come the first message. After 25 years, this pastor teaches on tithing. And you think, oh, my goodness, here we go again. Well, if that's you, then maybe the message is not for you. It's just we need to deal with it. We're looking at a series on survival. And basically, if I am not being obedient to God and not giving as God has laid out in His Word, then I'm disobedient. And if I'm disobedient, then I'm going to be selfish. And being selfish, I'm going to be more concerned about myself than anybody else. And that is not what the Lord needs right now. If there's ever a time for me to forget myself and begin to live for others, it's right now. And so, living for the Lord, and that's what it's all about. In 1 John 3, verse 16, it is one of those as bad as Malachi, but in the New Testament. It says, Hereby perceive we the love of God. So, John now, 90 years old, is writing about that agape love. And he is saying in a very profound way, this is how you're going to tell if you have God's love or not. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. So he laid down his life, we ought to lay down our life. Verse 17, but whosoever has this world's goods and sees his brother have need and shuts his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, verse 18, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Father, we thank you that, God, that you have given to us not only Malachi, but, Lord, this evening, 1 John, teaching us the importance of putting others before ourselves. And, God, I pray that you would just remind us that what it is to come to a point of dying to ourself, that, God, it's painful, and yet, Lord, we see things that we would love to do, but, God, we're seeking to know your will and do what you desire in our lives. And we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I read this little thing today as I was putting things together, and it kind of blessed my heart. It says the preacher of this church, no doubt Pentecostal, begins to walk around the stage, congregation, you know, uh, and begins to start saying, we need to start walking. We need to start walking. And the congregation says, that's right, preacher, we need to walk. We need to walk like real now, real right now. The preacher turns around and says, like fire from Mount Carmel came down, running. We need to run, church. We need to run. And the congregation says, yes, pastor, you need to run and we need to run. Start running. And the preacher says, let's mount up in the wings of eagles like an eagle and fly. And the congregation says, amen. Pastor, we're going to fly. We're going to fly all the way as high as we can get. The preacher begins to talk about flying. We're going to take some money. And the congregation says, no, no, pastor, let's walk. Let's walk, pastor, let's walk. (laughs) <laughs> you know, again, bam, right back to reality. And so, you know, you can pump it up, do everything, but the bottom line is, you know, it's the love of God that constrains a man. And boy, I'll tell you, you ought to do what God wants you to do in your heart. Never be pressured to do anything in your life. And you ought to really give where you're being fed and really support where you're going to fellowship. So oftentimes we give to other things that aren't supporting really the work of God. So tonight, how do you give? And that's kind of interesting. We looked this morning on the heart, but I want to give you some scriptures to really meditate and get this through, this through and I think it's going to help you. We can either give like flint, or we can give like a sponge, or we can give like a honeycomb. A flint, to get anything out of it, we've got to hit you with a hammer, and then all of a sudden the flint begins to come out. And that's not our purpose. Then you get only chips and sparks. To get water out of a sponge, you have to squeeze it. So the more we pressure you, the more we tell you the great needs, the more you feel pressured and you're going to give that way. The honeycomb just is overflowing with its own sweetness. 
And I think that when you finally get to a place that you enjoy where you're at, doing what you want to do, giving becomes absolutely natural. It becomes something you want to do, and so you should never be forced into it. And so the conquest of self, it looks for its own advantages. In other words, if you're going to look at how and why do we give and not give, you just really have to get down to selfishness, and that's what it is. If I'm going to be obedient to God, then I'm not going to worry about what the Word says concerning myself. I'm going to be obedient to what God said. So if He says to give, I'm going to give. I'm not going to question it. But if I have to begin to figure out, well, should I do this or should I do that? And then what you're really saying is, am I going to trust God or am I not going to trust God? Am I going to be self-centered or am I going to be sacrificing my life? And if I only give that which I have, then that is a sacrifice. If I'm given out of the abundance, that's not a sacrifice. So he came to the widow, you remember, and he said, let me show you guys something, the 12 disciples. He said, look at this widow. She's given everything she has, two widow mites. To the Pharisees, they were given what they had. In other words, they were given out of the abundance, but not really costing them. Jesus said, you remember, to the widow, this woman has given her whole life's earning, two-tenths of a cent, basically a quarter of a cent. Then we read that David, when he sinned, he came to buy this threshing floor. And Aaron said, go ahead and, and I'll give you this, I'll sell it for this much. And David said, no. I'll not give to the Lord except it cost me. In other words, if it doesn't touch my heart, it doesn't really sacrifice my life to do this, then it really probably is not going to be a great offering to the Lord. And you ought to do it to the Lord. You ought not to give God the three-legged animal, give God the four, and you keep the three. In other words, give God the best. That's always what you want to do in your life. And so it looks for its own advantages. In other words, it disregards the needs and feelings of others. That's selfishness. Secondly, selfishness is like the Dead Sea. It's always receiving, but never going anywhere. And when you have th things coming in and not going out, you're going to be like the Dead Sea, just dead. And selfishness is like a rust of a ship. You're going to have to scrub it and paint it and scrub it and paint it because the rust is always going to keep coming back. Selfishness is always going to kind of creep up and begin to defend your position or declare who you are. And once again, selfishness is really high treason against Most High God. God's saying that He is the Lord, and He makes the call, and I need to be obedient. But we see in the Bible many times about selfishness. Lot was extremely selfish. He was the nephew. He was not the uncle. It was, you remember, Abraham was the uncle who took his nephew, Lot, with him. Out of disobedience, yet Abraham did it anyway, and said, once again, Lot, go ahead and choose what you want. Instead of Lot saying, no, Moses, you are my elder. Abraham, you're my elder, and you can make the choice. He went and made the choice, and it was a bad choice. So when I am selfish, I will make bad choices in my life, and it will bring great destruction in my life. Saul was a selfish man. And how do I know that? Because Samuel said, Saul, I want you to go out and kill Agag. And he was really a symbolic representation of the flesh. And when he came back, he had the sheep and he had Agag. And Solomon, I mean, Samuel couldn't see at that point. He was blind. He said, what is that babbling I hear? And who is this standing before me? And this is what Saul said. Oh, the people made me do it. Well, that is about the most selfish thing in the world. It's kind of like Adam when he got caught. Well, I didn't do it. It's the woman you gave me. She did it. <laughs> And the woman said, not me, it's a serpent you made. So God is constantly getting blamed. Or what about Achan? I think this is a great story when you think about it. God said, I'm going to give you all the land. All I would like to have is Jericho. Just this little city of Jericho, I'd like to have that. You can have all of Canaan for your own possessions. Houses that you have not built, places you have not lived, vineyards you have not built. Just, I want Jericho. I want the first fruit of the land. And so everyone understood except Achan. And when you understand his name, it means trouble. And he was one Achan dude when God got done with him. And so it says that in the craziest thing, he went and stole a Babylonian garment and hid it. And to me, it's like so practical. It's like, what are you going to do being an Israelite wearing a Babylonian garment? When are you going to wear it? In the middle of the night in your tent going around a fireplace? You, what are you, you can't enjoy it. So you're going to sneak out in the backyard and go over the hill and wear it? Hey, I have a Babylonian garment on. I mean, it's about the dumbest thing you can think. But we, we do those things. It's crazy. Or the same thing with, you know, um, 
in the Old Testament with Naaman and his servant. All of a sudden, or I should say Elijah and his servant Gehazi, he stowed everything, but he had to hide it. And so Elijah said, what did you do? So oh, I was at Starbucks, having a Starbucks, and he said, no, you weren't. You took this and you hid it. Well, he can't use it, and so you sometimes get things you can't have. You get a great, nice old car, and you won't park it here. You park it down the street. And so, you know, it doesn't make a difference what you do. It's just that sometimes it governs our life. And what about Ananias and Sapphira? I mean, here they saw the praise that went to Barnabas because he gave everything. So they lied to the Holy Spirit, and both of them were killed. So this selfish life can really destroy a family. It can really destroy a life. Jonah was very selfish. He knew what God wanted, but went the other way. And he jeopardized people's lives. He made people throw their own possessions into the sea, and everything they owned, they had to throw into the sea, and it was his fault. So when people become very selfish, they don't really realize how selfish they are. And so it's kind of like conceit. Everyone knows you have it except yourself. And that's the tragic thing about it. Jesus here, actually Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's the way the Bible is. If you're going to pick up cigarette butts, then whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. In other words, do with a singleness of eye. And do your marriage as unto the Lord. Everything you do, do for the glory of God. And then Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, he says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thy increase. So you just got Canaan, everything of Canaan. So all God wants is Jericho. Give him Jericho. When you have a sacrifice, God wants the fat. You can have the uh, steak and you can have the Try tip and you can have everything else. God just wants to fat. <laughs> why? Because it smells better. That's why. And so he says in verse 10, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall be burst out with new wine. So when I begin to understand the principle of giving, then things begin to happen. And it's just a miracle, the things that happen. God does a great thing. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it shall be given to you, measured, pressed down, Shaken together, sounds like you're making a malt. Running over shall men give to your bosom. For the same measure that ye melt, it shall be met to you. In other words, the way that you have done it to others, it will be given to you. Ecclesiastic says, cast it out seven ways. Eight, it will come back to you one way. In other words, when you minister and bless and give, sooner or later it's going to come back your way. You don't know where, but it's going to do that. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth or rust does corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart. And Jesus was saying, if you're going to be and understand the greatness of really... Uh, investing you can look at all the investments you have made and they will never equal up to what you've given to the lord god will take it multiply it and he'll do more for the kingdom of god and it's a great thing when you begin to realize the freedom and so you know i like to give things away so god give us a church that people give us things and so we get computers and we give them away and people do things and we give it away i like doing that so if you're like that, you like to give things away, and you say, well, we have nothing to give, then start giving something away, and God will begin to add to it, multiply it, and so on. But in 1 Corinthians, it goes on to declare, now concerning the collection of the saints, and this is what we're going to look at tonight, concerning the collection of the saints, as I give order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay himself in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So that verse is a pretty powerful verse. There's five incredible little simple tips to do. And I think if you could really pray about this, take it down, it's kind of interesting. I read this in the Wall Street Journal. This was put in the Wall Street Journal. It defined money from the Wall Street Journal. Someone wrote, an article which may be used as a universal passport to everything except heaven, and as a 
universal provider for everything except happiness. Isn't that profound? In other words, money is great. I mean, let's go out and have some in and outs. I, if we had it all, we'd buy in and out for everybody tonight. Wouldn't that be fun? But it, that's all you can do is put fat in people. You, it won't get you to heaven. So, you know, and then someone's going to murmur, ah, oh, my in and out wasn't cooked right. Well, you know, he just bums you out. So here he says, as an article which may be used as a universal passport to everything except heaven. You can open doors, you can feed the blind, I mean, you can open, do so many things, but it will not get you to heaven. Secondly, and as a universal provider for everything except happiness, it will not bring you happiness. More millionaires and billionaires have killed themselves because of this incredible burden of money. It can go, it can go quick as you think. But in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, upon the first day of the week, and what we're going to look at is five things. Number one, we're going to give promptly in verse 2. We're going to give personally in verse 2. We're going to give properly in verse 2. We're going to give proportionally in verse 2. And we're going to give practically in verse 2. So you have some five Ps right there. And you can hang on to this, but kind of a good way, something to think about. First of all, he says here in verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 2, upon the first day of the week, and we can stop right there, the first day, that would be today. In other words, set aside that which you want to do. You don't have to run in here and, oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You ought to be prepared. The last thing you want to do is like, well, I don't care. I mean, you can do whatever you want. But really the proper way to do it is to know in your heart what you want to do before you come. It's like worship. Now, there are moments where you get inspired and you want to give more. That's fine. Or there are moments like you completely forgot and you're trying to do it. So, you know, you can't find anything. Well, here's a buck. Well, that's good. I mean, praise God. But is that really what you should have done? Have you made this area of tithing a part of your worship, your giving? Because it's between you and God, not between anyone else. It's what you have purpose, and when you do it is the first day of the week. Now, we have different things, and people work different hours, and things happen, so we have boxes in the back of the church. And the reason why, let me just tell you, because I don't want you giving me the money, or I don't want you giving the pastors the money. I, we don't want that temptation. We don't want to touch the money, so I don't touch it. I can honestly say and look you right in the face and say I have never touched it or looked at it or taken it or I don't even know who's given it. And that's the best, because if you only give a dollar and I find out, I'm going to come knock on your door. I mean, I'm preaching my heart out, and you're giving a buck, keep it. <laughs> that's how I feel. Keep it. You know, that's all you can, but that's, that's it. Now, if you're poor, and that's all you have, then that's like a million dollars. And so, there, we get ties from people in convalescent homes giving two dollars. That's like a thousand dollars. Then we have 90 cents from some people. Because they're just whacking and they're disorganized and we're trying to worship and you're dumping your purse out and the phone's going off. You know, we'll take it that way. But you're not worshiping, you're not focused, and you're not doing it really the best way. So if we're going to do things right, we've got to do it right. And so you ought to talk about it. You ought to pray about it. And so you have to do it promptly. It says the day of worship, the church. And once again, the day of proclamation to share this is the day i want to do because of what god's done in my heart because of all the things that god has taken me out of because he has taken me out of drugs and given me a family and put me in the ministry this is the day that i have and so when i travel and speak at other churches i give i make sure i always have money together and always there ready to give because what they do is they skip me like i don't want to give and yet, I should set the example. So I want to do that first day. And so we do it on Sunday and Thursday and Sunday night, and then we don't do it any other time. And I think that's really the best. Secondly, so give promptly. In other words, be ready. Ready. And if you're crying about it, don't give it. Because it won't count. In other words, I can't believe it. My last two bucks. Keep it. Because it's not worth it. And you have to be hilarious. <laughs> I couldn't use it anyway. Give it to God. And there's a true story. One time I told Pastor Window, I said, let's give 10000 20000 to the Gideon to make Bibles because it's dollar for dollar Bible. And that's great to me, great evangelism. And he kind of stumbled and think, well, you know, uh, okay, okay. What do you want to do? Okay, can we do 10? Sure, no problem. 
Well, the very next Sunday, we got a check in the mail for 100000 And Wendell said, oh, I wish I would have given him 20. I said, well, <laughs> you know, bud, what can I say? You're an accountant. It's just that's the way it is, you know. It's just like you, but I tell you what, if you have that gift of faith, it's kind of exciting. Now, if you start challenging God, then God might not give it down here. He'll give it in heaven. So don't play with him because <laughs> you can't win. So number one, give promptly. Number two, give personally. In other words, every one of you, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, every one of you. What, now, what does that mean? Uh, uh, does that, I'm single. I don't have to give. No, you have to give. I'm married and broke. Do I have to give? You have to give. I, I'm a widow. Do I have to give? You have to give. You know, I'm just a bum. You have to give. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a pastor. You really need to give. What can I say? So it has nothing to do with rich or poor. has nothing to do with healthy or sick has nothing to do with young or elder, has nothing to do with married or single. It says everyone, because God has touched every one of our lives. Again, I said this morning, and I want to say as positive as I can, the government is doing what we should be doing. We should be really ministering. In the Old Testament, they gave 33 and a third percent. Oh, you're kidding me. I know. You really have a good deal with this 9 and 10, 90% and 10. You remember I said this morning, you got two plans, one, 90% and 10, and you and God are partners, or 100% and you're on your own. When I say that, this freaks me out. I don't want to be on my own. I've messed everything out. So I'll take God for the 10%, and that's what he's saying. Well, in the Old Testament, they'd have to give uh, you know, 10%, 10%, 10%, and every third year, they have to give another 10%. So it comes out to be 33 and a third percent a year. That's a lot of money. And then they couldn't cut the corners. You know, if you had a piece of land you had to make a sweeping turn you couldn't back up and get it because the corners were for the poor people to glean in so the church and the people were ministering to everybody else not the government but because people are not doing what they should now it falls on the government when it's totally the church's responsibility and if you go back you realize that every university every hospital was started by what churches Yale, oxford all those were christian uh universities until they walked away from God. And so everyone, and here it is, everyone. And then number three, giving properly. In other words, giving properly. It says here in verse two, lay by him in store. So it means giving it to him. A tithe belongs to God, to the temple. So people say, well, can I give my tithe to missionary work? Not really. You really should give your tithe to where you're being fed. Anything above the tithe becomes an offering, and that's over and above. So if you want to give 15%, then you give 10 to the church and 5 to the missionary reaches. Why? Well, if you give the 10, say, to something outside, like a parachurch, that's cool, and God will make meet our needs. But you're being fed here, and you're growing here, and the lights have to be paid, and this place has to be taken care of. So our priorities a lot of times are wrong. We just kind of choose where we want to go. And God doesn't do that. He says, you bring it to the temple. You bring it to the place you're being fed. Now, if you're visiting, then it's not really you. In other words, you can do what God wants you to do, but you ought to do something. Just, just do something with it. And he says here, lay by in store. And so the place of the temple. And so you bring it here. And the reason why is look at the needs around. Light bulbs and things and all kinds of crazy things. And the other thing is if you want a great staff, if you want a great building, if you want great things, we can do it. But it's all of us coming together. It's everyone. And you say, well, how do you do that? I don't know. I just know that we give and God multiplies. When a ministry is on fire for God, I just don't worry about the finances. We are out there in the missionary work doing radio, and that's unbelievable money. But I believe that it's reaching people, getting people saved, and we are feeding people, and that's part of your ministry. Everything we do actually becomes part of your life. So if you give here, everything we do, when I go to Washington, you basically, it goes to your account. When I'm able to minister to congressmen, I have dinner with Randy Forbes. When I have dinner with the, you know, the Supreme Court, it goes to your account. Everything I do, every person that comes to Christ 120 people that came to Christ at that Baptist church or that Pentecostal church, they go to your account. So all of a sudden, it becomes kind of cool to see what God's doing. When we reach out and buy t-shirts for the kids in ninth grade, that 
came out of the funds which you have given, and you are part, and so they gave me an award for it. But it's really your award because you did it. Now things are happening. Things are beginning to explode. And when Dennis got himself in trouble, not really, but he said, we'll take a part. Well, that's 10000 bucks. You remember that? And I'm saying, I'm in my heart thinking, oh, Lord. Dennis, he's saying, we'll take that park in Jesus' name. Honor, he's talking to the mayor. And I'm thinking, Dennis, you just committed us to $10,000. Well, that day he had to do washing the cars. And so I made a joke about it that he's up there trying to raise money, pay his debt. Just kidding. Someone wrote a check in for $20,000. He says, let's pick up two parks. So you don't have to do it, but someone else did it. So all of a sudden, people sometimes give for special things. Now, there are moments where people who are very wealthy want their money to go to something very special. And so they do that, and I have no problem with that, as long as it's for the kingdom of God. So here we find, very simply, number four, give proportionally. It says, as God has prospered you, as upon God has prospered him. So now, what does that mean? Well, that means some of you are going to give a little bit. Some of you got to give a whole bunch more. Some of you, given 10%, is just flat sin. Because there's so much you have, you really are just, not, it doesn't touch you. Other people who are barely making it, they're sacrificing. So here's the key. Is it touching me? Do I feel the sting of it? Am I thankful for what God's done? Maybe for some of us, we need to give a little bit more. And then fifthly, giving practically. And this is kind of cool. That no gathering I come. In other words, that there be no gathering when I come. Don't make a scene. Don't make it something that you're drawing attention to where Paul is going to be embarrassed. These simple five rules are really important. So here's what I would say. If you're going to keep it in the realm of worship, then number one, do it in your heart and figure out what you want to do and have the check made ready or get things together or take a bunch of envelopes home. Do the best you can so you can come and worship God and drop it in and you're done with it. There are many people that just send it in. There are many people that just deduct it and send it through their business. It's unbelievable what people are doing. Secondly, give personally. In other words, you figure out everyone, not just some of us, but everyone takes the burden. Right now, I mentioned that 30% give, 70% do not. They say that 80% are not in the Bible, 20% are. Now, check it out. You basically have a carnal church. So I'm ministering to a church that is disobedient in giving and disobedient in reading God's Word. So Kevin has to prime the tank and get it going. And by the last song, you're excited. Now, not this church. Your guys are excited all the time. And all of a sudden, this church is fun to teach at. And you basically are pretty good givers. So I'm blessed. I mean, this is the best church I've ever had in my life. But you're, yeah, you can clap. It should be. You know, it's the greatest church we've ever had. Because it's cross-culture, we're learning, we're growing, and we're having all kinds of fun doing it. And so those are the principles. Now, let me bring one other thing to you. When Jesus ministered to the rich man, you remember him, the rich man? He had a farm, and he kind of defined selfishness. And I want to kind of end before communion. And he was successful. In other words, he was very, very successful. And Jesus tells his parable not to embarrass him and not to get on his case. And I think a lot of times we make a mistake. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy and rich. There's nothing wrong with having homes and cars and boats and everything else. And there's nothing wrong with being able to be used by God in some of these exciting ways. There's nothing wrong with it. But what's wrong with this story is the man did not bring God into his life. That's what's wrong. I was asked to teach a thousand bankers about something of Christianity. And so I chose this passage. And I talked about the rich farmer, that this night God was going to require his soul. And it wasn't wrong that he invested, wasn't wrong that he tore down his barns, wasn't wrong that he was now making more money and using money and prospering himself. What was wrong is that God is never mentioned in it. It's all about him. That's the problem I have with people that become wealthy. The Bible says not many rich, not many nobles make it into the kingdom of God because it turns your heart. He said to Solomon, be careful because these women are going to turn your heart in a very horrible way. And it's about enjoying things. And he was satisfied. In other words, he was willing to rob God. This man was willing to rob his family. This man never did anything for anybody else. And that's what really bothered the Lord. 
You see, here God gave this man incredible wealth. He was absolutely, no doubt, one of the most wealthiest men in the Bible at this time. It's a parable. He's wealthy. But what did he do with it? He took it to himself. He held on to it. We have an old saying, you remember in the world, don't hoard that joint. I mean, give it. Don't hold on to it. He held on to it. He was hoarding everything. I'm not going to give it. I'm not going to give it. And all of a sudden, he's holding on to it. That's what bothered the Lord. I gave this to you because I wanted you to use it for the kingdom of God and to help other people. As you saw fit, as you opened your eyes, as you saw needs, you can do that. Now you look at, you know, what sometimes Bill Gates is doing. What do you make? $51 billion last year. And then, um, what's his name? Just gave him $49 billion. So here's the wealthiest man in the earth. And Bill Gates just said, I'm not giving anything to my children. <laughs> Which is probably good. Because he's going to definitely take care of them, but he's not going to give them a vast wealth because they can't handle it. So what does he do with it? He's trying to deal with cancer, trying to deal with all this stuff. That's what people do that we don't see outside this body. People that are very wealthy usually invest or do things or buy things or build hospitals. I know people that are personal friends that have given churches or I should say the hospital $10,000. $10 million up here and over here $5 million and you know, another person gave $8 million over here to this hospital. They're trying to help people and that's what they're doing. So you're saying, well, give it to me and I'll bless people. Well, <laughs> they did that when they had nothing. You see, but if I'm not doing it now, I won't do it then. And that's the problem we have. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 16, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plenty. So God blessed him. He thought within himself, what shall I do? One eye. Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. He said that this will I do. I will put down my barn and build greater, and there will I bestow my fruit and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast done good. But God said, you fool, this night your soul is required. There's nothing about other people. That is what selfishness is about. What does it take to be happy and successful? How much is enough? 27 cars, enough? Fine, buy them. But then, why did God give that to you? To buy 27 cars? No. He gave that to you to use to turn the world right for his kingdom. And notice again, six times he uses the word I, five times he uses the word my. Then in verse 17 through 19, he was a foolish owner. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do because I have no room and there to bestow my fruit? He's going on I, 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 I. And that was the problem. He condemned everybody else. And it wasn't that God condemned capitalism. Here, he, it Capitalism didn't belong to him. And he didn't condemn socialism, but he condemned selfishness. Because who gave it to you? God. And that's all I'm saying. If you get a bonus, you ought to just stop and think, God, thanks. You don't say, I did this. You say, God, thanks. Now, what would you have me do? What would you have me pay off? How would you have me, oh, no, I'm going to go buy a new car. Wait, you're in a recession. You're going under. Think about it. No, I don't have to. I can do what I want. No, you can't. It's not your money. It's God's. God gave you the money. God made you a steward. God made you faithful. God wants you to be responsible. And check it out. The more faithful you are to bring God into your life, the more God's going to give you. I like that. I'll try real hard to give you, you know. So it's not prosperity. That whole prosperity thing on television is an upside-down pyramid. In other words, it's like you give, 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 and you have nothing, but I have everything. No, if you're going to teach that prosperity doctrine, everyone should have a brand new car, not just the pastor. See, that's the problem, that prosperity thing. Everyone gets blessed except you. You have to give, 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 sacrifice, 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 but the pastor doesn't have to sacrifice one bit. He gets to drive and enjoy himself. Well, that's not what God's saying. He's saying as we are obedient, God's going to bless us. And then he goes on to say, in verse 19, in a very powerful way, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much good. In other words, I can do what I want. I built this. I did this. I was able to do this. No, you didn't. 
God gave you breath. God gave you a mind. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes that God has given riches and God has given wealth. All God wants you to do is acknowledge Him. He does not especially want you to give it. And in fact, I will say this. The greatest danger in the world is when you find an egg and you see that little chick trying to get out of it and you help it. You basically kill that chick. Because if that little chick cannot break her way out or his way out, they're never going to develop the wings they need to fly. And so by helping, you now take away the ability for it to gain muscles. So sometimes we use the money to help people when we shouldn't. So you have to ask God permission. Do I use my wealth for this or do I use my wealth for that? The question is, do I bear fruit? Do I see fruit? Do I see people coming to Christ? Where can I put the volume of money where I really need to see it, where it's going to make a real difference? Otherwise, no, you do not have to help somebody. You see a brother who has need, he's begging, he should be working. I wouldn't give to him. I'd help him find a job. Or I'd give him a hamburger and go get a job. But sometimes people take advantage. And so all you're doing is enabling him to be a bum longer and longer and longer. Sometimes you want to help pay up you know, somebody's bills off. Oh, do that? Please, pay my bills off. Well, fine. You pay the bills off, you're going to go charge again. No, I won't. I promise you I won't. Yes, you will. No, I won't. Yes, you will. Because it's just part of your life until you personally have to suffer and pay it off. Then you're never going to do it again. So sometimes blessing people isn't what God wants either. What God wants is for you just to bring God into your life. You know, it's like before Kevin could buy another guitar, he has to ask us what color we like. That's all. You know, the pumpkin one just kind of gets to me. And then he has the green one, and then the yellow one. You know, I just don't know what to say to this guy. You know, but he says, it's my money. No, it's not his money. It's, God's, it's not Kelly's money. It's God's money. God gave it to him. Well, he'll tell me, well, God gave me a great deal, and God told me I could have a pumpkin, and, and, but he has the pumpkin. And we love that pumpkin. We love both of them, don't we? <laughs> and we really don't care. I just, I just am concerned that he and God are okay on having this thing. The same with me having a car. Am I okay with God? See, I don't care what you have or what you drive or where you live or how many homes. I just want to make sure you don't leave God out of it. Because who gave it to you? God. And here's what happens. We all of a sudden get money and then we stop going to church on Thursday night because we're going to do a business deal. I can tell you this because he's not here. There's one man that I really do respect, and that's why I hired him, Wendell, because he's never missed a Thursday night, Sunday night, or Sunday morning, ever, in all the years I've known him. And he's never done business on those nights. He's always put his business second when it comes to that. Most people would do contracts or sell a house or do this on a Thursday night. He refuses to do that. And because of that, he was number one salesman for 40 years in South Bay. You see, God honored that, and I was able to see what was the priority of his life, and God did it. What happens in our life, we get it, we build a business, God brings it in, and Satan brings it in on Thursday night. No, I'm not going to do it. And the moment you compromise, then you have basically, you have put no to God and yes to this material wealth. If they can't wait, then it's not meant to be. And maybe God's going to save. It. It's a tough lesson. And then here in verse 19, I'm going to build it higher and stronger and bigger. And then he said in verse 19, the time to be married. And I will say to my soul, be married. No, 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 no. This is a time not to live on the edge. This is a time not to live too high. This is a time to stop going shopping every single day. This is a time to stop buying clothes. In other words, just stop for a while to figure out what's going on in your life and what's going on in the country. Just kind of back up. Because in verse 20, but God said, hey, tonight, not tomorrow, tonight, I want your soul. And the man was absolutely gone. From absolutely wealth to poverty. And he stood before God. And so what did you do with what I gave you? I built them bigger. And I built them wider. And I had more. And I did this, and I did that, and, but I never gave anything to anybody. And then Jesus would say, but what did I do for you? Well, you gave me your son, and you gave me your Holy Spirit, and you gave me everything. Why couldn't you do that? 
Why did I choose you? I chose you so you would be an instrument of who I am. Belshazzar couldn't figure it out. Nebuchadnezzar couldn't figure it out. These men could not figure it out. But God made them wealthy. And so money is an interesting thing. Death knows. Death knows so well what we do. And I, I'm not kidding. I mean, I, it's good to go down to a dump yard every six months and just look at all the people have burnt, all the things burning. These are what people have died for to get this stuff. And yet, it's worthless. So, here's my exhortation to the church tonight. John Wesley said, make as much as you can. Save as much as you can and give away as much as you can. But you have to answer one question. Not me. Not any pastor. Not anybody. Is God part of what He's doing in your heart? If you are extremely successful, is God part of that? God would like to be part of every facet of our life, small or big, poor or rich, weak or feeble. doesn't make a difference. 